with me in your Bibles today to um, James chapter 1. And I want to begin reading with um, verse 16. What I really want is down a little further, but I want to back up and get the context. I think the most exciting thing about looking at particular verses is looking at the verses around them and seeing how they fit in with the overall idea. James chapter 1, verse 16, he says, uh, Do not err, my beloved brethren. Err means an error. Do not make a mistake. Or he's getting ready to tell us something that he feels like you might be prone to uh, make a mistake about. So he says, Do not err, my beloved brethren. Another translation says, Do not be thrown off course. And here's what he means, verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So when he says don't get, off thrown, uh, don't get thrown off course and don't make a mistake, he, he wants you to be sure that you understand that what comes down from heaven is good and perfect things. What comes down from heaven from our Father, uh, He sends us good things. He sends good things into our lives. And He doesn't want you to get the wrong idea and think God's sending anything bad your way. Um, you know, this reminds me of something Jesus said when He was teaching in the sermon, what we call the Sermon on the Mount. He said, uh, which of you that's a father, if your son asks for a, a piece of bread, will he give him a stone? Well, the answer, of course, is of course not. You know why? Because as fathers, we love our children. And so if they ask for a piece of bread, we're not going to trick them. If they ask for something good, we're not going to give something bad in its place. If your son asks for a fish, you're not going to give him a serpent. If he asks for something good, you're not going to give him something bad. And then Jesus says, if you, being evil or carnal or just you know, normal human beings, if you know what it means to be good, how much more does your Father, not how much less, but how much more does your Father in heaven want to give good things to those that ask Him? And James here is making the same point. He says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down. I love the way this, the thought is that everything good and perfect, you know, we know, for instance, instinctively that, that what's in heaven is everything's good and perfect and wonderful, you know. And when, when people finish their earthly life and, and, uh, and leave here, their spirit leaves their body and uh, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord, we don't anticipate a lot of bad things in heaven because there aren't any bad things in heaven. There's nothing that hurts or kills or destroys and there's nothing bad in heaven. But see, it says here, notice what he, the way he says it. Uh, what it, what's going on in heaven, good and perfect things, uh, every good and every perfect gift is from above, and then it comes down. Down is where we are in relation to heaven. comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So the thought here is that He's sending, sends down from heaven good to us. Now, with that in mind, go on and read the next verse. Here he, he describes one of those good things, one of the things that comes down from heaven for us. Verse 18 of His own will begat He us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of His creatures. When it says, of His own will begat He us, begat is an old English word meaning to give birth to, or uh, to, uh, to produce His offspring. He brought us into being. To be brought into being is what that means. To begat, He gave birth to us. Now He doesn't mean when you were born... Uh, however many years ago it was, I was about to say, use my, I'm going to leave my number out of it. <laughs> however many years ago you were born in the hospital from your mother, he doesn't mean that birth. He means when you became a Christian, when you received Jesus, uh, the Bible calls that and counts that as a birth, a second birth, a birth from above, or Jesus calls it being born again. He says, of his own will, that means it was his will, and it was of that will, the will of God, he begat us. Notice what it says, with the word of truth. Now, I want to call your attention in these next few verses to what, how he uses the, the word, the word, word. He begat us, or he brought us into being, or he gave birth to us through the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits. Uh, I looked up the word first fruits. I have a, a dictionary at home called Smith's Bible Dictionary, and I looked up first fruits. Now, just to read it, I thought in, instinctively in my mind, first fruits means when you have a harvest, the first fruit that comes, the very first that you harvest, that's the first fruit. That's what I thought. But when I looked it up, I found out that's not what it means. According to Smith's Bible Dictionary, the first fruits doesn't mean chronologically the first, but it means first in importance or priority. It means the best part. It doesn't mean necessarily chronologically first, but what's best. 
And when, uh, when offerings in the Old Testament would be called first fruits, it means to bring the best part. And so when he says here that he brought us into being so we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures, he doesn't mean that we're first chronologically uh, as Christians, that's what he's talking about, but the best part of his creation. So he said that he brought us forth as meaning gave spiritually gave birth to us as Christians so that we would be the best part, the high point, the climax, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the best part of his creation. Now, I want to talk just a moment about this, how he begat us by the word of his truth. I think it's worth uh, uh, looking a little more closely. I'm coming back here to James, uh, but turn with me just for a moment to John's Gospel, chapter 1. I'm trying to be careful, and I used to say, hold your finger there in James, and then somebody said, you, I've run out of fingers, and so I want to be careful with your fingers, but I'm going to go back to James, but now I want to go to John's Gospel, chapter 1, and talk about this, uh, explore exactly how this is that he begat us, or gave birth to us through the word of his truth, to get at exactly what he's talking about. John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 11 it says, He, meaning Jesus, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. Now, He is Jesus, but who are His own that He came to that didn't receive Him? Well, what He's talking about is the physical offspring of Abraham. When God promised Abraham a seed, the first uh, natural interpretation of that was the offspring that came through Isaac and then through Jacob and became the, the children of Israel, it became the nation of, the nation of Israel. And that group of people, God's chosen people, His old covenant people, were His old covenant people in the old covenant. Jesus came. Uh, Paul tells us that Jesus was actually, literally, the, the spiritual fulfillment of that promise made to Abraham. So Jesus came as the seed of Abraham to minister to the physical descendants of Abraham. And He had a special and a unique ministry during His three and a half year ministry to, to Israel. You know, people. Uh, one time, a woman came to him, a Syrophoenician, the Bible says, and uh, with with a, a daughter who had a, a, an evil spirit or something like that. And and she said, "Come and minister to my daughter." And Jesus said something very strange to her. He said, uh, "I'm not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel." That's what he said to her. I'm not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And I've heard people say, well, he was using reverse psychology and he was trying to be tricky. He didn't really mean that. But guess what? He really did mean that. During those three and a half years that Jesus ministered in his physical body to a physical people, the nation of Israel, he was exclusively ministering to them. The Bible says, Paul says this, to fulfill all the promises made to the fathers. See, God doesn't leave any promises unfulfilled. God upholds His end of the bargain no matter what anybody else does. And Jesus came and devoted Himself exclusively to the nation of Israel during that generation, uh, the offspring, the physical descendants of Abraham, to fulfill everything that was promised uh, in the Old Testament. And so it says here that those were His own. He came to His own. Those should have been His own. They should have recognized Him. They should have received Him. He was their Messiah. They didn't receive Him except for a small number, except for a few. Uh, his twelve disciples and a few that were, Paul calls a remnant. Uh, he came unto his own, but his own received him not. Now what does it mean when it says they received him not? Well, they didn't accept him. Number one, they didn't believe him. They didn't believe what he said. Now, now think about this now. When it says they received him not, what does that mean to you? It means they, they didn't believe him and they didn't accept him. Is that right? Is that right? Then the next thing it says in verse 12 but as many as received Him. Now, what does it mean to receive Him? It means to believe Him. It means to accept Him. Now, that includes all of us. We are those who have received Him. I like to give this illustration. Sometimes when somebody comes to the door of your house, you choose who comes in your house. Not everybody can just come in your house. You have to open the door. Isn't that right? Now, you know, I should admit this, but sometimes people come to the door of my house and I don't want to let them in. <laughs> I hear a knock at the door, and I look out through the blinds, and if I see they've got religious literature and I recognize them, haven't been there before, I don't, I don't want to be more specific, but you might know who I'm... There are certain people who go around door to door and hand out their religious literature. And I, in the past, I've spent a lot of time, lots of time talking to them, and I found out they didn't come for me to talk to them. They came to talk to me, and if I'm not... I don't want to hear what they have to say, and they don't want to hear what I have to say, so I uh, don't always open the door and let them in, you see. And I'm just using that as an example to say that I choose who comes in my house. Is that right? You choose who comes in your house. Now, when you open the door and let them in, you have received them into your house. 